Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy that uh, you're with us. I'm excited about this uh, uh, f uh, presentation. Um, I'm a gadgets person. Ah. I love gadgets, and we have a person with gadgets uh, uh, that tries to help uh, people navigate the world. The other person, however, is, uh, is a prophet of data. Uh, I have a friend who told me that uh, database people who, people who created databases and indexed them are prophets of science uh, data. So we have with us uh, Patty Mays, is the German Hausen Professor of Media Arts and Sciences at the MIT lab. She runs the Fluid Interfaces Research Group, which does research at intersection of human, computer, interaction and artificial intelligence with a focus on applications in health, well-being, and learning. Also, we have Alex Kummerman. He's the pioneer, uh, he's the pioneer in computational systems for environmental and health innovation, co-founder of Lazy Brain, though there is no laziness about that. Uh, and Alex Kummerman, pioneer innovation, uh, sorry, uh, He's a pioneer innovations at the intersection of AI, human health, and environmental sustainability. So let's welcome them both. Okay, so first let's go to Patty. Um, how are your devices, first you're gonna have to tell us about your devices, how are they making us what we want to be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um I think that, well, all of us already carry smart devices with us all the time, our phones, of course, smartwatches, rings, and more. And increasingly, these devices are getting smarter, not just because of AI, of course, but also because they are getting more sensors or access to more data about ourselves and our environment. And so these devices, while well, today, they primarily just help you keep track of some health parameters, like they may tell you about number of steps and heart rate and how much, how well you've slept, etc. Increasingly, I think that these devices will take a much more active role in helping us uh, stay well and helping us really with optimal potential, optimal well-being. They will in real time intervene to help us uh, maybe, for example, sleep better um, or, or more soundly or uh, make smarter decisions um, and more. Can, can you describe what these devices look like? What do I do? Do I wear this device and who is it helping? Yeah, so these are really sort of the next generation consumer electronics devices and they don't look that different, say, from your smartphone here, mm -hmm. but increasingly, again, they will have sensors. Uh, maybe I can show you some examples. Um, can I have the slides? So yeah, for example, uh, this is a device that we developed for elderly mm -hmm. people where instead of your phone being in your pocket, you actually wear your phone and it is constantly paying attention to what a person does with their hands. And so the system is constantly creating a big uh, log of all the actions taken by the individual. For example, she picks up the bottle of water, she puts the bottle of uh, water down on the round table, etc. And that system... Can you check? Uh, it's not yeah. running. Yeah. Oh. And uh, what you can then do basically is the elderly um, uh, person uh, can basically, help and we don't need a sound, thank you. To help the elderly live we don't need a sound. at home. Yeah, no sound. Meet Sherry, who lives by herself and uses Mempal to help her so find objects. So this elderly individual basically has that device and it tracks what they do with their hands all day long and can make sense of what they do, like, oh, they're making breakfast, they're turning on the stove, etc. And the system can then help you with uh, misplaced objects, or it can prevent uh, that you take your medication uh, a second time if you've already done so. It can send uh, a report to the caregivers to um, 
uh, the doctor that takes care of these older adults so that these older adults can safely remain in their own home living independently while still preventing a lot of safety issues and while be having their memory augmented by this AI system. Uh, the caregivers of this older uh, adult, the children, for example, can get summaries saying uh, your mother had three good meals today, she went out for a 30-minute walk, etc., thereby easing their anxiety possibly about uh, their mother. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to come back to this because yeah. I have lots of questions about this. Yeah. But Alex, uh, there's lots of data now being accumulated, especially with devices like this that have AI. And you've created a system where it indexes the information and retrieves that information faster than anything else. Can you tell us about it? Sure. Thank you uh, for asking. So. Um, Yes, we live in this world where data is um, uh, everywhere. Uh, there's a data deluge, not only from the new smart device, but as well uh, in everything related to our health. Uh, doctors have uh, our x-rays, our CT scans, uh, our um, uh, temperature. Uh, so, so there are plenty of uh, diverse data uh, that are uh, actually structured uh, for us uh, and kept uh, into uh, different types of uh, uh, st data structures. So it can be um, text and images, it can be sounds, um, it can be uh, numbers, it can be uh, database. And this diversity of data is actually uh, a big problem because there is no harmonization uh, available. And so that uh, if you want to process the data with efficiency, you have to develop a new type of indexing and a new type of um, storing the data um, that is the one we've been working on uh, for a few decades already. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, the way we process data is we harmonize the data into a, a very large, single, uh, large number. Uh, and this large number is uh, then um, structured and laid upon what are called space filling curves. Um, and those space filling curves have very powerful properties. Uh, and among one of their properties is to be able to index the data, which is a way to uh, find the exact information you need uh, into this deluge of data so uh, that is available. So when you say large data, how, how big is this data that you're looking at? And how fast can you get this information? So, so, so the... the the technique we use is almost real-time, uh, so it can provide very useful uh, future use of the data. Uh, but the, 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 you know, we, are, we are in this world where data is everywhere. Uh, we have digital twins, we have um, digital smart cities that are indexed, we have data is actually the oil of uh, today. Huh? Uh, but the problem of the data today, it's, it's not um, well organized. And, uh, and, and so that this new type of organizing uh, the data is uh, very promising for the future. And, and it's actually extremely large. So we, we, we are in, into, you know, beyond, uh, um, it's, 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 uh, it's almost difficult to, to, to imagine. And, and the, the parallel, just to, to make an, uh, an understanding of it, that what we can do is, is to play with numbers is something very abstract. And, and we had this conversation uh, already. And, and, and so if you take, um, if you try to represent what means um, a million seconds, right? It's quite easy to compute. And it's about 31 days. Huh? But where you move from one billion to uh, one million to one billion, uh, it goes to 31 years. All right. So, so days to years is is actually a huge, and it's just million to billion today. Moving from one million to one billion doesn't seem a lot. So, the the, the to understand the breadth of data around us is something very abstract, and and that's what we are trying to work on is ways to structure the data so that we can extremely efficiently and with extreme accuracy, which is greatly required in the health sector, 
um, to be able to find the exact data and where is data located in the hard drive, in the memory of the computer uh, that are providing uh, the data source. Excellent. Uh, Patty, for the device, I noticed that there was a phone. There was a phone that's capturing the... What's the ultimate shape of, uh, shape of this device? Is it going to be here, connected? I mean, hung on your chest or yeah. on the head or...? We're experimenting with multiple form factors and trying to understand what people prefer, but the devices of the future increasingly will use conversation in addition to other sensors uh, to help a person in real time um, in a conversational way, but while being aware of what is going on around the person, maybe even what is going on inside the person mm -hmm. with brain-computer interfaces and more to help that person in real time with um, optimal health, optimal performance. So, well, I think Alex is uh, doing all this hard work in the background of um, storing all that data, making it uh, easily accessible and so on. Ultimately, what that means for the individual is not just better healthcare because we can make a lot of discoveries from these large sets of data that are being collected, but also much more personalized health solutions that are much more preventative rather than helping people when they already have developed certain chronic diseases. So increasingly, I believe that our devices will um, be more uh, on top of uh, the individual's health than we ourselves or our doctor. Your device will uh, notice when maybe you're slipping into a depression before you are aware, before your family, friends notice anything, because before, well before you go to a doctor and can actually help you um, with that particular uh, potential problem, mood problem, well before it becomes a much bigger problem. So I, that's what excites me in the area of health, that we can really um, make it more prevent, <clears throat> preventative, um, that we can make it very accessible, and that we can make it very highly personalized, not a one-size-fits-all, but really healthcare for one individual based on their unique needs and issues and so on. A uh, question, uh, the, the, the device that you're creating is made for the elder, uh, elderly, mm -hmm. but can it be applied to other people as well? I mean, uh, there are people with OCD, Definitely. for example, there are people who forget like me, I forget I put my mm -hmm. keys somewhere and then that's it, yeah. they're gone. So yeah, we're very excited about other use cases as well. Um, in my lab, we're especially focused on the elderly, actually, because this is, of course, a growing problem. We have a growing older population, not enough young people to take care of them. Older adults want to live independently in their own homes as much as possible, and, uh, but in a safe way. So that's one population that we focus on. But then we also focus on uh, young people, on uh, children, on young um, uh, adults and so on, who are uh, still developing, growing. So I anticipate a future where maybe that same device that is aware of a person's context and so on can act as a Socratic tutor for a child, where every child can have their own tutor that knows what they know, what they don't know, how they like to learn, what motivates them, what excites them. And instead of um, the way today's AI systems work, which just give you all the answers and, and don't encourage you to think for yourself, these AI systems can, be, um, can have a style of interaction where they engage the child a lot more in learning, in asking questions, in making discoveries for themselves. So I feel that we're really at a, uh, we've really ignored the way we interact with AI so far. The focus on AI research and development has been all on the engineering, make these AI systems smarter, better, less biased, fewer hallucinations, more efficient and more. And what we have to think about now is 
how will they fit in our lives so that people ultimately benefit, not the companies making these systems? Mm, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, there's a, a TV show or a uh, movie, the movie they made, uh, uh, Lost in Space, mm. where the girl was recording her whole day, everything she does is recorded. So I'm seeing a future of that sort where everybody just records everything they're doing throughout the day and then going back to it whenever they want to. But that's creating lots and lots of data that you want to mine into. Mm -hmm. um, and keep private. Yes, yes, yes. So question <laughs> yeah. for you, Alex. Um, I noticed that you have created something groundbreaking in Bustrophedonic geometry. What is that, and is that related to the data that you're doing and getting the data faster? Yes, absolutely, it is. So, Bustrophedonic is a is a geometry that uh, actually exists since a long time, but has not been uh, developed sufficiently enough. And so, the Bustrophedon is is a is a way to um, describe a continuous line. Uh, and what we do is we organize the data on those lines, on those curves. So if you, if you take um, a, plowing, a plow and you try to plow a field, uh, the way you plow the field is you go from, let's say, left to right of the plot, and then you, you turn, and then you go from right to left, and you continue and you plow that field. And that type of plowing is actually inspired by the Greek way of writing, ancient way of writing Greek where they continued to write um, on a continuous line without interrupting uh, at the end of the line and, and starting again on, on. So this type of curve is one type of space filling curve that we use. And what we've done is um, uh, those type of curve have evolved in time and uh, they have been um, discovered by uh, Hilbert and Piano in the late 1800s. Uh, as being a very powerful way to be mathematically efficient to preserve locality. So it, now it's a, it gets a bit complex, but, but um, what it is about is that you can um, keep dimensions uh, and reduce dimension to a single dimension, which is this line. Mm. So by preserving the dimension and the locality, you're able to have a very powerful indexing solution, and that's a way to organize the data. But it's as well a very powerful way to cluster the data. Uh, and that becomes a very efficient way to bridge with the AI. We just mentioned, Patty just mentioned that it's, you know, we are, we are trying to build modern ways of having AI helping us in a Socratic way. Um, this will require to have uh, a new type of AI that is uh, actually understanding the, the specifics and be able to pinpoint back to a, an exact data set uh, and not doing too much of this just generalization of the process. So this is a new type of AI called neurosymbolic AI where the neural part is already what we are using today, but the symbolic part is the mathematical dimension of it, which is a much more um, a, a way to Im instill reasoning in uh, the AI mechanisms. So you're, you're using AI also to determine, uh, to index, you're saying? So, so the AI part is uh, used in the, in the clustering part mm. and in the way we are actually making discoveries in the data. Um, so the challenges today of data are that they are um, not well organized, so we have those lines that, and this geometry, bustrophenonic geometry, that is allowing us to organize the data more efficiently. But as well, um, there are now ways to compare patterns because it's a geometry, geometry being a way to visualize mathematics. So in our case, it's a way to visualize the data. Um, this visualization allows the AI to look at patterns and to look at similar traits or comparable data sets that helps to discover the, the exact information that is needed to be discovered. As, aside from the information, can you find emotions as well? 
so, so indeed, cognition is, is something that we can record. So we can record face ex expressions, so that becomes a visual data set. We can uh, record some changes in the heartbeat. Now I'm on stage and I have a harder beat than if I'm not. Uh, and, and this can be recorded, so it's a type of emotion. And all those data inputs that are captured by the devices, by the modern devices, can be processed as another dimension of data and be processed efficiently, potentially in real time, uh, to dis discover some patterns. So, so if you have data about me, would you be able to know my emotional state? Probably, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's got to be really private then. Huh? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And so <laughs> privacy is absolutely paramount. And it's a huge topic. Uh, and especially when it comes to extremely personal data as the one we have. If we look at genomic data, is, uh, my genome is totally unique and it's mine only. No one else in my family has my genome. I am the unique one to have it. My ch children might have some part of it, but it's not only mine. And my parents have a different genome. So, so, so this uniqueness of data makes it extremely private. But as well, if we expand it a bit more, everything related to my lifestyle, my health, my well-being, or my emotions, or my cognition, are part of my data sets that I should be the sovereign of. Uh, and and so, so being able to encrypt efficiently data is something that we are as well doing a lot of research on and have quite advanced with the same indexing and Excellent. custom technology. So I'm, I'm thinking of a future where Dr. Paddy would have the device connected to me, getting everything, and then sent to your database, and then my wife would know if I'm angry or happy or sad. <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> uh, no? Well, I think we should, to the extent possible, run AI on edge devices so that we can preserve privacy. Mm -hmm. There are definitely benefits to pooling data of many people, but then, of course, there is a risk that your data can be uh, abused and so on. Um, but yeah, to the extent possible, we like to run things locally. Also, I think a skill like your wife recognizing your mood, I don't know whether I would, as your spouse, want to delegate that to AI or develop that, old, that skill myself right. yes, <laughs> internally. Yes, well, I mean, if you have somebody so, with autism, maybe yes, that'll help as true, well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you have something quite interesting it's future you using the devices you're mm -hmm. creating. Can you tell us about this? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that I really am interested in helping two groups of people, the elderly and then young people. And one of the things that young people have trouble with is thinking long-term and acting in the interest of long-term results and impact. And so we created um, a website, an experience that you can send all your children to. It's called futureyou.media.mit.edu. Mm -hmm. And it's a place where you can upload a picture of yourself and you can say what your goals are with life. Like, I think maybe I want to become a, a biology teacher or a medical doctor, whatever. You give the uh, system some information about yourself and then it creates an older possible version of you, a version of you at age 60 that you can talk to, uh, you can have a chat with. And so you can ask things, well, what is it like uh, to be a biology teacher? What are some, what is a typical day like? What are some positive and negative things about being a biology teacher? You can try out these different futures. You can even use the system many times to compare possible different things that you could study and so on. And what we showed together with psychologists from UCLA um, and using human subject experiments is that this experience encourages people to really think and act more in their own long-term interests. Um, things like saving money, um, caring about your education and learning, um, caring about the environment and long-term impact of your actions on the environment. So it is, I think, a very interesting technology to 
uh, enable behavior change in people. Is this based on the data that you get from the person first and then you apply that to the yes. future self? Yes. Well, in this particular system, because we want to open it up to everybody, we just have people enter uh, some information so anyone can use it. We have about, um, I forget how many, but hundreds thousand individuals from 170 plus countries using it and often coming back to try different futures, different possibilities uh, for themselves. So it's not based on any data that we collect from wearables. You have to enter some I, of I that data. I can go on the website myself you and do that. You can go there now and do that. Which yep. website again so that... Uh, so it's called futureu.media.mit.edu. It's primarily... Um, designed for younger people, mm -hmm. um, so rather than people who are close to age 60 <laughs> and have already... Ah, so it, it um, is at yes. age 60 that you're looking at? Yes, so you look at a 60-year-old version of yourself and so talk I, I to I know what my future 60. is. It's yes. only two years from now. So. <laughs> uh, we're going to open yeah. for questions in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how many of you want to actually find out what the f future is like for you <laughs> at 60? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, not many? Uh, half. I say ha half of you want to know the future. Okay, so n th that's something interesting because uh, you're dealing with data that is current. Mm -hmm. Now we also have data of the future. Mm -hmm. How would indexing of that look like? Mm -hmm. And would you be able to find interesting information and data that is futuristic? So um, the data um, is... It, it, what. What has been created by Patty and her lab is a, is a digital twin pushed in the future. Mm. So there is a knowledge base of what it is about to be 60 that you can query now. Okay, so, so, so the, the, the data is the data we know today about what is it to be 60. And the digital twin is the interface to be able to access this knowledge base and understand how I could look like or how I could be in three years for me um, <laughs> uh, uh, from now. And, and so uh, the, the, the way data is uh, uh, processed is actually the same if you are creating a, 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 a digital twin or something that can be real time. And that's very important, uh, a very important paradigm and actually a huge challenge of today in the health sector uh, uh, when you look at how we are uh, able to get together all those that different knowledge about what is it uh, to be a human and how can we organize this data in a meaningful way to be able to make queries into different types of scenarios, one being pushed in the future uh, with the knowledge of how it is to be today. Yeah, Alex, what applications have you already applied this uh, multidimensional indexing? Yeah. And, and what, what did you find that is so interesting in the data that was not expected uh, mm. when you found it? So, so the, um, the two uh, examples I can give are related to um, digital imaging, um, and especially the imaging of uh, soft bodies. So, for example, if you look at um, the heart, we have this incredible organ um, that is our heart, and uh, it doesn't have a solid state. It is a moving material. It is a soft body. Mm -hmm. uh, and to be able to know how the structure of the heart moves is something that is extremely complex because not only it moves every at heart, every heartbeat, but as well, it moves um, in, in depending on the position I have uh, in, in my body. Um, and so that if you want to be able to create a digital twin of the heart, for example, to be able to access with a, a specific tool to make a surgery of the heart, you have to index that soft body. And that soft body has to be very well uh, defined so that the, 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 the tool to make an intervention on it, for some reason it, it, it sounds a bit bizarre. Um, so so that, that's one example of extremely complex indexing of soft bodies. And that's where we are now today and that is where, where it's going to be in the future. 
uh, soft body indexing is something that has been uh, challenged and it now being solved with modern techniques uh, of indexing uh, data. Another example uh, that I can share with you is uh, related to uh, the understanding of our genome. Um, so we've discovered in the 2000 uh, that we can organize our genomic data based on uh, a quaternary structure, ATGC, um, and it's uh, thousands of pages, uh, 30,000 of pages of just these, those letters ATGC that are just organized. If you, uh, you know, that was one of the discovery of the of, of, of the, the DNA sequencing, and and modern techniques have been used to try to make sense of this data and understand what are the diseases that are related, related to our genes. And this has been made through what is called alignments of special, spe specific parts of nucleotides or genomic data um, that are suddenly making sense because we compare them among each other. So a, a healthy body is compared with another one and if there is an alignment, then it means there's probably nothing. But if there is no alignment and a difference, then it means there might be a problem. So differences, similarities are what we are searching for to be able to discover uh, the relationship between a genome and a sickness. Mm. And, and, and that's how uh, data is processed to be able to make discoveries using uh, modern techniques, modern alignment techniques. Amazing. Okay, so now we have 15 more minutes to go, and I'm going to open uh, it for questions. If you have any questions, we'll start with you. Just raise your hand. I'll, uh, let, uh, yeah, please. Uh, do we have a mic or? Yeah, it's coming. Here. Yeah, thank you for the session. I'm Tom Myers. I'm from Belgium. I'm an osteopath and I futurized myself uh, 25 years ago using what the app is doing for 10 to 60 year olds. So I was wondering, um, is this going to be available also for not just children because adults are also struggling, imagining and what is called future self-continuity. Exactly. Uh, so from whole Hirschfeld, I suppose yes. you are working we with together. With yeah, so yeah. I'm in yeah. connection with him as well. Yeah. And so also to share some information about my personal experience mm -hmm. to using this technique yes. as an adult from 29. Uh, when I did that, it was absolutely a magical experience mm -hmm. that everything I said I was going to be, mm -hmm. I am today. Mm -hmm. in just 25 years. So I really want to see this app grow and also mm -hmm. be available beyond yes. 60. Yes, you know, that's as definitely our intention. I need it as well. <laughs> 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 and I'm Belgian too, by the way. <laughs> really? Let's connect But yeah, afterwards. we work <laughs> with uh, Hal Hirschfield, who is a psychologist um, at uh, UCLA, and um, he basically invented this concept of future self-continuity which is a sense of people sort of thinking more about their future and, in, and acting in the interest of uh, the future. And he has experimented with all sorts of interventions for helping people think and act more long term. Um, and is now working with us on this project. Yeah. And that's the interesting part of how osteopathy also from a brain perspective that the future mm -hmm. you is a stranger you don't know very well so why invest into it yeah. so when you make as futurists we are here much more on the technical side but also from the personal side mm -hmm. we need to be more emotionally engaged yes, with our future exactly. self so that that future discontinuity which yeah. exists from our ancestral uh, evolution that that shortens mm -hmm. and that we become more engaged. So for long-term exactly. thinking, ecology, sustainability, yeah. and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I, I yeah. thank you for your research and uh, let's you. connect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So next question. Um, okay, fine. Thank you so much for sharing your insight. My name is Rasha and I help a lot of companies communicate um, with media and with other um, partners just to 
get buy-in for their new products and services. And I'm curious to know, there was a point made earlier about these proposals and research that create change that they have to be really entertaining. And I'm wondering when you're presenting your research and you're trying to work with different partners and stakeholders, what are some of your challenges when you're trying to communicate all this complex information about AI and data, um, when you're working with new people, going to different cities, um, what's some of your challenges in presenting this information to bring buy-in? Mm. Yeah, well, I th I, it, Alex, I, I, uh, I, I, you I, I, have that challenge more yeah, than I is, do. I was <laughs> telling him it's a challenge to yeah. actually yeah. convey yeah. what yeah. it means. Yeah. So, so yes, there, so there are multiple um, answers to this question, and, and it's a layered thing, right? So it really depends on your audience. Um, and for us, um, so one of my activities is Lazy Brain, which is an, a serendipity accelerator that has a front end for the end user. So it's m much easier to communicate that part. When you are speaking about what I do as a, a scientist and, and involved uh, in, pat in a small patent uh, factory, independent uh, factory, uh, producing patents in this world where big tech is uh, everywhere, um, the challenges are much greater. Uh, and, and so the way we are addressing um, the communication and the way we are going to uh, promote our work is through examples. So the idea is to be able to have storytelling that is built from what are the results rather than try to explain it from a scientific perspective uh, because it's, it is difficult to convey um, some uh, complex science progress to an audience that is um, sometimes don't have the bandwidth to just capture uh, what is being said. So in our case right now, we are developing an example where you can prove that some discoveries have been made uh, thanks to alignment of data, and that helps us to promote our licensing uh, mechanism and help us to do better business. Uh, Paddy, you had an answer as well? Um, well, my work is very much driven by real problems um, in the real world and really by this question of how do we design AI so that ultimately people benefit? How do we use AI so people are better off, more capable, uh, they can reach their potential rather than, say, purely designing AI to replace people? I think yeah. it's the outcomes, mm -hmm. uh, the results, the, yes. uh, the benefits yeah. that you get from this that yeah. help people understand what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next question. Hello, uh, this is Tolga. I'm from Istanbul, Turkey, uh, and thank you so much. It's incredible, your work and the way you moderate. Uh, my question is, um, it's like I use multiple variables and my personal experience um, is that sometimes using variables is uh, taking the autonomy outside of me and putting it to the, this device. And it kind of makes me lose touch of myself. Mm -hmm. So it's, it becomes difficult to uh, self-judge if I slept well or if I feel good, if I, how do I feel? And we, I'm kind of dependent on seeing my data, which I actually could easily uh, have the access to through just maybe closing my eyes to two seconds and feel how did I sleep. But I end up looking at these devices and it's kind of taking my power away. Mm -hmm. um, which I, I'm a big fan. I stayed in, I worked with Google 10 years in the health projects. Now I'm in the longevity wellness field. I believe in it, but my um, concern mm -hmm. is that it's going to take us away from us. Mm -hmm. So how would you suggest anyone, maybe in the future generations, to like what areas that they should take care of yeah. in their life so that they can be more prepared mm -hmm. and they are not alienated yeah. from themselves and dependent on machines and technologies? Yeah. Mm, good question. I, completely agree with you and I think we need to have more conversations about um, what types of 
what parts of our lives we are willing to delegate to AI systems, we are willing to depend on AI systems for, and what other knowledge and skills and so on we really want to preserve and um, internalize and, and deal with ourselves. Um, I agree that if, uh, if you don't use it, you lose it. <laughs> sort of if you don't um, write a lot, you always use ChatGPT to do all your writing for you, then you become a worse writer. So we're not thinking enough about the long-term consequences of relying um, or, or using AI uh, in our daily lives. And I think in some cases it is justified to use AI and have it automate things on our behalf. Uh, for example, with the older adults who have a uh, uh, decline in their cognitive performance, uh, their short-term memory is declining and so on, they can't like, get it back. Uh, unless you can do something about it with your longevity work, but they can just practice their memory more to get better or something. So I think in certain cases, it is justified to uh, basically let people have this clutch or this uh, rely on this AI technology and de be dependent on it if that raises their possible performance. But of course, I would never want children uh, to rely on memory augmentation because then they never take in the knowledge and connect it to other information and other things they uh, should be thinking about. So we, um, it's not a one-size-fits-all mm. also, yeah. Okay. Did you want to say something? Maybe I just add something to it. And, and I think there, is, there, is a, um, there are some different um, categories of, of, of knowledge um, and, and different um, reason why we should remember something about us. So, so the, the data that is provided by my wearable device might help me to do something, but should not be guiding me. It should just help, it should be an assistance. And what I'm saying by that is that if, if it helps me to better learn, if it helps me to better use my cognition capacities, if I'm helped to um, accelerate my reasoning process, then it's something that is well designed. So it's a question of designing the experience so that we are empowered to be better. And, and in some cases, um, and it often is the case, if we are well understanding our past and the past of our ancestors as well, uh, we are, and, and, and look at it with the perspective of now, we are better prepared for the future. So this, um, look in the past now and this vision for the future is something that we have as a human capacity that can be enriched or augmented by the data that we produce rather than the other way around. That's amazing. Um, where's the microphone? Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, Samandari from Sol.com. Uh, a simple question to uh, uh, comparing data that we get to a healthy body. Mm -hmm. How do we define a healthy body? <laughs> well, that's a very good question. Uh, it's, 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 so, so there are some parts of us that are healthier than others, right? So if you have a tumor cell, you know that you have it or not by comparing the one that is actually being affected and the, the one that is not. So there are some comparables that we can cre have in nature without taking the ensemble of the data, but just chunks of it. And that's how genomic data is processed, is by looking at just specific parts and comparing the specific parts that have not any signs of um, problems. Um, so so, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a short path to explain, explain it, and, but there is, there are the, in science, there are always, we always try to compare. Huh? And, and so this comparative has to be based on some data sets that are the ones that are referring to. We use a meter long, so there's a meter that has been defined and that grades everything. Uh, and we compare distance with this meter. Um, and and so, so that's the, the way we are making progress in science is by comparing with existing data sets 
uh, of previous um, anal previously analyzed information. In, in, it is not a holistic approach. It is a very segmented and fragmented approach, and that's why we need to have access to extremely accurate data points that are helping us to understand the details of it, where the machine can process it with much more efficiency than we human can do. Thank you. Yes, uh, good afternoon, over here. Uh, here, right here. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to ask a question regarding the system that you created with using an AI. Um, my, my question is more from a psychological perspective. You know, always when you ask people, did you imagine that you will be in this job in the future? They will say no. Um, I wouldn't imagine that I will be ended up here. <laughs> and my question is, what if in, the, in one of the time there is a child who put this information, he want to be this person in the next 40 years, but then it ended up by having different curves. And this person got so attached to the mm. personality that he saw in the future. And then he got so disappointed. Have you thought of, like, mm. what if that happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, the whole uh, situation is much more complex than uh, what I talked about here today. Some of the things we do are, um, if somebody says, for example, I want to be the president of the United States, <laughs> and this is where I am right now, and what I've already accomplished, well, the likelihood that that will happen is very low, of course. Uh, so we actually try to uh, basically take into account what some more realistic types of futures are that people can talk about. But in other cases, people actually don't set a high enough goal for themselves. If somebody comes from a family maybe where they haven't, their parents haven't studied and so on, maybe they are not imagining a future that could be, that they could reach. So we also try to help people aim for higher futures if they're not uh, aiming high enough. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I'm afraid we're out of time, but you can come uh, to uh, Patty and Alex and ask them more questions after this. But let's thank them both for creating a better future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.